Hey everybody, you're watching another episode of the John and John Sports Talk Show. My name is Jonathan Conti. Sitting next to me is my co-host, Jonathan Vincent. And joining, on, joining us via Zoom is head coach of Sacred Heart Football, Mark Nofri. Coach Nofri, thanks again for joining us. Thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate yes, it. of course. So now coming off a 27 to nothing win this past weekend over Wagner College, you guys now control your own destiny with the NEC Conference Championship and uh, a potential berth in the FCS playoffs. You know, how do you guys respond, you know, controlling your own fate? What's the approach in this upcoming week? So, um, you know, we've been looking at this for probably the past three weeks now since uh, the St. Francis game back in, uh, I think it was November 6th. And, uh, I, you know, we told the kids, listen, you got three games to play. And if we win out, um, we would be able to control our own destiny. And, and that was our goal. Uh, we don't want to have to win or share it with another school or worry about another school winning tie in how many points have you given up there's too many different scenarios um and i know i know for a fact that the kids are hungry they want to win a northeast conference championship be the sole winners we want the automatic qualifier from the nec uh and they took care of business at st francis on the road two weeks ago they took care of business against wagner last week and, and this week we're going on the road to liu so there's one left to go awesome so just so I'm clear, too, if you win the NEC outright, that's an automatic berth to an FCS. Correct. Yeah, whoever wins the Northeast Conference um, gets an automatic qualifier, the AQ, to the N FCS playoffs. Uh, there's 24 teams in the field when they start, and, you know, there's some at-large bids. There's not a lot, uh, but the Northeast Conference does have the automatic qualifier. So this past spring, we had won the conference in our spring season. We had played Duquesne for the championship, won that game. So we were given the automatic qualifier this past spring as well. Uh, in the spring, because of the COVID year and not all the FCS teams played, they cut the field down to 16. Uh, so we played Delaware in the first round back in April um, of 2021 when we won the spring season. So we did go to the playoffs in the spring. We're hoping to repeat here in the fall of 21 and, and go again. So my other question, too, before we keep going forward is, you know, you got LIU right now this week. Uh, they're two and seven, if I'm not mistaken. You don't look past them, right? Absolutely you know not. What's I mean, stage. this is so why this is why you play the games. I mean, if it was uh, looking at paper and statistics and you know who's returning, like we, it, it, you got to go out and you got to play. I mean, we came off our last loss was October second against Howard uh, University. They were zero and four at the time, um, and I think we were two and two and. You know, we just didn't play well, and we got beat by an old 14. And anything could happen at any given point. You know, you sit here and you break down all of LIU's games. They've already beaten Central Connecticut and Wagner, so they've won two conference games already. And if we don't play up to our potential or our capabilities, then we're going to get beat. And, you know, our focus right now is this Saturday and not the playoffs yet and taking care of business and what we can control. Well, it's funny you kind of mentioned that loss to an 0 and 4 Howard, you know, at that time in the season. How do you guys prevent, you know, how do you guys speak to the players, especially? Because at a young age, it's hard to not look at the team that you're playing right in the moment if you know that there's so much going on past. How do you guys as coaches really get that message across to the players that this is the game that we're focused on? Nothing. You know, I got a very senior oriented team. I have a lot of graduate students that are returning for their fifth years. I have a lot of seniors that are two seniors this year, um, and they're hungry, and they understand. I mean, they're mature. They get it. Uh, they didn't play well down at Howard, and we were a different team back then, I think. Um, when they know there's a championship on the line and they know they have to win the game, I think they're pretty hungry, um, and they know what they're, you know, the task is standing at, you know, right in front of them. And it, they don't, again, they don't want to get into the scenarios, what if, Sharon. They want to take care of business, and their focus right now is – LIU, from the weight room to the film room to the practice field, everything we do this week starting yesterday at noon when we came together again is all focused towards LIU, and that's the only thing you can do. Awesome. Yeah, no, so, Coach, you're a 7-3 and three football team on the season so far, you know, averaging 18 points per game on the offensive side, but only allowing 14 points per game on the, the defensive side. Is the defense setting the tone for everybody else, or, or are the stats, you know, not showing justice for you guys over on the offensive side as well? I will say the defense has been playing really well the last four games. Uh, you know, they pitched the shutout this past week. Um, they're really, really coming into their own, and they're playing hard. They're playing, you know, physical with that chip on their shoulder. Offensively, uh, we've been racking up yards. Uh, it doesn't do it justice because we had two turnovers in the red zone this past week. 
uh, versus Wagner, and one on the seven yard line and one on the 12. We had two turnovers in the red zone versus St. Francis. Um, you know, we get going and then uh, we get down there or there's a 15 yard penalty. So we've been moving the ball up and down the field, but I think we are shooting ourselves in the foot in playing that game within ourselves. We talk about it all the time and I've talked to the kids. I think if we play up to our capabilities, there's nobody in the conference that could that can beat us but ourselves. And, uh, you know, the last two weeks has been a little disappointing with the penalties and the turnovers, uh, but there's still high powered offense. I have two of the best running backs in the country, Julius Chestnut and Malik Grant. I got a quarterback that's season in Marquez McCray. I got five or three out of five of my offense linemen are either seniors or grad students. I got a tight end that's a six year uh, in Ed Cuddy Heat. And I got Rob Denoden, Nassim Brantley, and Kenny Womack on the outside. So there's weapons there. Um, and, you know, like I said, they have a lot of talent. We just haven't played well on that side of the ball the last couple of weeks. But, you know, when the time comes and they need to score or they may need to make a big play, they do it. So, um, it's kind of a little bit of each, you know, I think they have more in them and I think we're better than what we've showed. And, uh, if we cut down on the mistakes that we make, that will be even better on that side of the ball. You know, I do have one more question kind of pertaining to this season and everything going on. I know you just mentioned Julius Chestnut and Malik Grant, you know, how those two work together? You know, it seems, you know, Julius Chestnut goes down with injury earlier in the year, comes back, rushes for over a hundred yards. Malik Grant is a Walter Camp, uh, award finalists down the stretch are is there any problems between the two or do they understand their roles in, in helping the team win they're they're uh two of the most outstanding people you've ever met um they're probably best friends they hang out together they room together on the road um they're watching film together they lift together they know their roles they know that they're both two dynamic football players and they're even better people off the field um it's been great having them both healthy the last two weeks, I think, you, you know, Julius is still knocking some of the rust off. Uh, but let me tell you something. When Julius went down the first game of the season, we had to play eight more games without him. You talk about a person stepping up and taking the brunt of everything and carrying his team. Uh, Malik Grant's rushed over, you know, his rush for, I think, close to 1,200 yards right now. Uh, and that's only in, what, eight games or nine games. He only took six or seven carries the first game. Um, but he's been doing outstanding outstanding work for us and he's proven to everybody that again he's gonna lead the conference in rushing he's I think he's third nationally in the FCS and then you got Julius that in the spring I mean we, we played five games in the spring and he already had like 850 yards and he was a Walter Payton finalist um, this past spring and you know the both of them are dynamic and they're great kids on and off the field and uh, I couldn't be happier for them they know their roles they work well together and they kind of feed off one another. Awesome. Well, Coach, you know, if we can take, you know, some of what you were just talking about in what's going on in this season uh, and moving forward to some of the questions that we have for you about your time at Sacred Heart as a whole. Now, just now you were just talking about the maturation of a of player who stepped in and filled the role and has done, from, from what you're explaining, a great job uh, at that. Now, you've been at Sacred Heart since 94. I'm curious to know, what has it been like to be a part of the program's maturation process as a whole for the program, not obviously just the one player like you were talking about, but talking about Sacred Heart as a whole, you know, what's that maturation process been like from 94 to now and what your experience has been like, you know, watching, you know, football at Sacred Heart grow? Uh, you know, it, it's always tough. I mean, you know, we were a new program and I believe it was 89 or 90 was the first year we had football and, you know, anybody, you can talk to anybody that starts football at a university, it's not easy. You don't just walk in and develop a winning program right off the bat. It takes years and years. Uh, and you need a lot of people to buy in and you need a lot of people to help you off the field. Uh, I go back and I look at the transition from Division Two to Division One AA um, and where we were, uh, what we've become and how we've grown and changed at the university since then. Um, when I got here, half the buildings weren't even here. Uh, and you go back and you look at and then the NEC went to, you know, a limited scholarship role and some of the scholarship issues that we had in the past, we don't have right now. And the budgets, I mean, you got, when you're building a football program, you have, to, number one, you got to get the players um, that you want and the players that buy into your culture and your beliefs and how you want to build a football team. And second, you got to have obviously great coaches. Uh, my assistant coaches are outstanding. Uh, they work their butts off at recruiting and coaching and teaching these kids. 
they have to develop the same philosophy or believe in your vision and what you're preaching. And they do. We're all on the same page. But most importantly, you need the support from the university. Our administration has been great. Um, you go look and you see where we were 10, 15 years ago in terms of a budget and staffing, um, recruiting, scholarships, facilities. That's all changed. You know, it takes time. I understand that. And people sometimes don't want to hear it takes time, but it does. And you need that support from the university. I, I can't tell you how much the school supports us in terms of admissions and financial aid and student life and, you know, the budget director and the senior VP, the athletic director, the president, the student athlete um, academic center. I mean, you got to get everybody on the same page and everybody's got to be pulling in the right direction for you to be successful. Um, and we've had that support. And I think that's why we've been successful is the people behind the scenes that's, that makes this place so great. And, you know, I couldn't be happier. And, you know, now, I mean, we've, we've kind of outgrown some of our facilities. I mean, you know, our stadium only seats 4,000 people and, you know, Duquesne game, October 26, we had 7,400 people here. Um, in the last, you know, we've been bringing quite a few, I think we've been averaging anywhere from four to 5,000 fans every game that we've had at home. And we've had six home games so far. So, um, like I said, it, it's been great. And I think the, the process doesn't happen overnight and it takes time. The university understands that as coaches, sometimes you're not, you don't want to hear it takes time and you, you know, you're not built that way. And you're not structured that way to be patient. You want to win now, but our school's done a great job in the last 10, 15 years to provide us with the resources that we need to be good. That's so, awesome. Well, I'm, I'm just so glad that you mentioned everything behind the scenes as well, because that's one of our biggest things when it, when we talk to coaches is, you know, it's not just the aspect of what happens on the field, the players on the field, but everybody that's involved, the athletic directors, strength and uh, conditioning coaches, everybody that kind of helps out. So it's, it's pretty ironic that you mentioned some of that information. Now, I do want to ask you, you know, since becoming the head coach back in 2012, how has your coaching philosophy changed? You know, it, does it change with the new recruits you bring in? Or are you one philosophy? You come in, you play a certain way, or, you know, do you change over time? You know, my philosophy as a program and how I want to build it has never changed from day one. Um, I want tough, hard-nosed, gritty, blue-collar type kids that maybe somebody didn't want because they were an inch too short or a step too slow um, and get them here. And I, again, I, I will still say this to no end that I have the best assistant coaches that work with kids that develop into great football players. I have one of the best strength and conditioning coaches in Chris Fee. Um, and if you look at some of these kids when they come in as freshmen and then you see where they are their junior, senior year and how much they developed. I mean, I, I want blue collar, higher than those kids that play with that chip on their shoulder. And, you know, it does me no good to go get a kid that, you know, is off the charts. He's a three-star kid. He's got all the ability in the world, but he doesn't fit our culture. And, and I tell the kids when they come on campus and they meet with us and they meet with our players and then they meet with me one-on-one -on -one with the parents, I tell them flat out, you know, I treat the weight room like we treat practice. We treat meetings the same way. You're not late. You show up on time. You're dressed accordingly. Uh, you keep your mouth shut and you work hard. You put your head down and you work. Um, there's no excuses. I don't make excuses and I don't want to hear the excuses from the kids. And if this isn't the place for you and you don't want to work hard, then it's not going to work. Um, you know, coming here, I think a lot of kids think it's easy. Um, it's easy to win championships. It's easy to walk into a winning program. It's not because now you're getting 45 to 50 freshmen every year that you have to weed out the ones that aren't buying into what you believe and what your program is about. And I tell the kids all the time when they're here on their visit, talk to the upperclassmen, talk to the kids in the program. They'll tell you what it's like. And you have to figure out for yourself if this is the kind of program you want to be a part of. Um, Scheme-wise, offensively and defensively, you make minor tweaks every year based on your personnel, who you got coming back, who you don't, what, what role do they fit or what role do they play. But we've pretty much been the same um, since 2013. We do tweak things on both sides of the ball and special teams, but – we have to find the right kid, and, and that's the biggest thing us as coaches and, and as a staff, we have to find the right kid that we want to be a part of this program. Uh, I, you know, when they come up for an official visit, they meet with me for half an hour with their parents. They meet, they have a one-on-one -on -one individual meeting with my strength coach, um, and he tells them the expectations. They watch film for probably 45 minutes to an hour with the position coach or the coordinator because we want to see how football smart are they, you know? We want to know what are they, I want kids that are football junkies. I want kids that love football. They don't just play it because it's the cool thing to do or because they're good at it. I want kids that want to watch film. They want to work hard. They want to be around us and they want to talk ball. Um, 
And again, if you're a good high school football player and you're willing to work and you have some ability or some talent and you come here, we'll develop you into an even better one when you leave. And, you know, I, I believe in that. I'm going to stick by that. Um, we've won four NEC championships in 10 years. And if we win this weekend, that will be five in 10 years. So hopefully it works out. And I think what we're doing and the kids that we're finding that my assistant coaches are finding and, and molding them and shaping them to what we do offensively and defensively has worked out perfect. And I think it's a tribute to them. Wow. I mean, I mean I'm almost, five and seven is yeah, no, I mean, one, that answer was amazing. I just want to say, this is something John and I have been talking about. You almost took a question off of our, <laughs> of our thing. It, yeah. it pertained to the fact that, we, you know, I've read one of your interviews and it said how, you know, you're not looking for the strongest, the biggest, the fastest. I mean, having those is great, but you want a kid who's going to come in and be a program builder. And, and to hear you say how important that is, it just, I don't know, that blows my mind. Yeah. And you talked about it so in depth. Um, we do we do talk about it sometimes like okay well why why wouldn't you take this kid he's all state he's all this he's leading well he probably doesn't you know i don't it's not that i don't want to take him if he doesn't fit who we are and what we do we're only going to have problems when we get here like if you get a kid that's so talented but he's always complaining about injury he's always got an excuse why you know he's not going to class or why he didn't you know the teachers you know out to get me he's late to the weight room he doesn't watch film on his own he doesn't come to like those things are just problems and, and you don't want that. You want the least amount of headaches as possible when you're running a program. I mean, I have 158 kids on the team. Um, it's easy to run a practice with 158 kids on the field. It becomes now um, the weight room. How many kids can be in the weight room at one time? You know, are we lifting? What kind of groups are we lifting in? You know, okay, how many kids got to go to study hall? Because there's no classroom on campus that can hold 158 kids for study hall. Uh, when we go to the training room, they can't accommodate 158 kids. So now you got to go and shift. So there's a lot of moving parts um, that you have to think about. And the last thing you want is kids that are showing up late or just doing it to get by. Like that's not going to cut it. And when you can get more people involved um, that have your same vision and your philosophy, you're going to be successful. The, the, it's huge that we're getting this information from you. First of all, because these are great things for anybody that's listening to be to paying attention to. You know, any coaches that are out there that are watching that you know are trying to get their notebooks out and take some notes on uh, on what you're putting down is great. Uh, you know, I myself am also a football coach too here at Nichols College, so I'm working the defensive side of the ball. So I'm taking a bunch of notes from you right now as we're talking. You know, there's been you know great things in terms of helping establish the culture. And, and what the expectation is as a program. So that's great. Uh, John, do you have another question? Yeah, you know, one of those things, especially talking about those kids that you're bringing, how important has discipline been for your program? Like for us, we've, we've seen a lot of football, like been on a couple teams, college football as well. We've seen teams that are disciplined and teams that are, aren't disciplined. You know, how important, you know, if that's even something that you guys really focus on, but how important is discipline for you guys to go out there, to play together as a team, you know, one unit, you know, is that something you guys preach over at? We do. We, you know, we, we have a big thing here that we hold kids accountable. Um, you know, a hundred to zero, you know, a, a, you go hundred miles an hour and give us a hundred percent with zero excuses. And we don't want to hear it. And, and quite honestly, I don't want to hear it. And if we're holding kids accountable and we go back and, uh, you know, let's say we have a bad week, we play bad on Saturday and uh, we lose the game on Sunday. I'll list, you know, I'll, Call them right out in the team meeting. Okay, this is what we did this week. Okay, does it transform? How many kids were late to study hall? How many kids missed their treatment? How many kids uh, were late to lift? Like those things all play into a fact of what you do on the field and off the field. And uh, for the kids that can't buy in and do things that we ask them to do, then after a while, we just cut them loose and, you know, they're not going to be a part of it. But you have to be disciplined. We talk about it all the time, but you try and hold them accountable. Um, Again, I, you know, the last two weeks, we haven't been very disciplined on the field. I think we've had uh, seven penalties this past week and the last week prior to that, I think we were at eight. Uh, you know, I'd like to keep it under four. So we haven't played that well in terms of discipline, um, but we do hold the kids accountable about what they do off the field to translate on the field. And uh, again, it's about the culture you built and what you want. And my strength coach is my right-hand man when it comes to discipline. The coaches all understand that. They buy in. They want the same thing that, that him and I want. And like I said, with a staff of 11 and then my strength coach, we're all preaching the same thing. It's a lot easier when everybody believes it and sees it. That's awesome. That's awesome to hear. I think you could 
close us out here if you have uh, any yeah, more questions. You know, well, first of all, just on the point of the discipline, you know, it's so important to, to be able to establish that. And I just wanted to clarify, you guys don't have any cuts, right, at the at the beginning of your camp or anything like that? The only time I'll cut a player is if there's disciplinary issues or uh, something's come about that, you know, reflects poorly on the program. Um, I tell kids all the time, and you'll hear me say it, uh, the logo never comes off. You know, when you wear your hoodie and your travel gear and your T-shirt, everything says shoe football on it. Uh, when you wear it somewhere, the logo never comes off. And we try and teach the kids all the time. Uh, wherever you are, whether you're home at Christmas or summer, or whether you're on campus or you're out on a Friday, Saturday night and you get in trouble, it not only reflects, you know, your family at home and your mom and dad and your brothers and sisters, but it also reflects the shoe football family. And that's why I tell them for four years that you're here, you know, you're part of the shoe football family. And when you get in trouble, it says in the newspaper or on the website or social media, sacred heart football player. And the logo never comes off, whether you're wearing that hoodie or not, you're still a shoe football player. And we try and instill to them that that means something and that you reflect who we are and what we do here. And if a kid, you know, doesn't do what he's asked or, or has represented the program in a bad way, um, chances are we'll be cutting them. But I don't sit here and say, you know, I'm going to cut 30 kids this year uh, from the team because I don't think they're very good unless there's disciplinary problems or they do something to embarrass the program, that they're okay. That's a great point. Yeah, no, that's I think that's point. really great. I, I think, you know, honestly, my last question, it, it kind of pertains to the football side of things. With SHU, how many scholarships are you guys able to give? I know a Division One AA school. How are you guys, um, how many can you give out yearly? You know, how does that stuff work? So the Northeast Conference is an FCS conference. Obviously, we have only the NEC rules. You can't go more than 45 athletic grant aids. So you can have a max of 45 uh, athletic grant aids if you're a Northeast Conference uh, team. And so far... We weren't up to speed. Um, you know, we were in the mid to low 30s for a few years there. Uh, just recently, we've got up to 41. Um, so most of the schools in the NEC have between 39 and 45. I think we're right around 41 or 40 point something right now when you calculate it all out. But you can't go beyond 45. And, you know, most schools, like I said, are between 39 and 45. Too bad. Awesome. Yeah, no, not bad at all. Well, Coach Nofri, we appreciate you again sitting down with us, able to, to give us a plethora of information. You know, yes. that I, obviously for my own selfish learned reasons, so yeah, much. I've learned so much. Uh, so we appreciate that and, and you sitting down here and giving us. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. And uh, anything I can do to help, if you need me to be on again sometime later down the road or any of my guys, uh, I got some pretty good players that will do a great job on the interviews for you. Awesome. That'd be man. great. Thank you very much, great. Coach. Thank yes, you again. again, thank you very much for coming on. To yeah, see. JV, just reach out to me, and I can take care of you with a player if you want, um, whenever. Ladies and gentlemen, you've watched another episode of the John and John Sports Talk Show here at Nichols College.